Good morning and welcome to the church here in Livingston. We're so glad to see each and every one of you here. If you are visiting with us, you are very special to us and we hope that you'll come back and be with us whenever you can. We would love to have you. Today we extend our honor and our praise to our mothers. Uh, for those that have done a uh, great job, they do it for 24 seven. Uh, so we praise and honor all of our mothers today. And of course, we're, we have remembrance of our mothers that have gone on before us. Thank you for being with us. Let's go ahead, Heavenly Father, in a word of prayer before we begin. Heavenly Father, to you be the glory in all things because you are the great I am. Thank you, Father, for your love to us. Thank you for your mercy. And especially thank you for your grace by sending Christ Jesus to us so that we can ha all ha mankind can have redemption. Father, we ask that you be with us as we study the word here this morning. As Brother Lendl breaks the bread of life to him, may we, may we absorb this and take it out far beyond the community in which we live. Go with us now as we go into our service. For this we ask in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's open our singing this morning with number 261. I am thine, O Lord, I have heard thy voice, and it told thy love to me. But I long to rise in the arms of faith, and be closer drawn to thee. Draw me near. Break me now to thy service, Lord, by the power of grace divine. Let my soul look up with a steadfast hope, and my will be lost in thine. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross. Where thou hast died, draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to the precious bleeding side. Oh, the pure delight of a single hour that before thy throne I spent. When Yes, please. 
streaming side. Before Brother Bill comes and leads us in prayer, let's sing number 415. More about Jesus would I know, more of his grace to others show, more of his saving fullness see, more of his love who died for me. More, more about Jesus, more, more about Jesus, more of his saving fullness see. More of his love who died for me. More about Jesus, let me learn. More of his holy will discern. Spirit of God, my teacher be. Showing the things of Christ to me. More, more about Jesus. More. Our God and Father in heaven, hallowed be your great and holy name. Father, we come before thee at this time, thankful for every blessing that you give us, thankful for life and for health and for strength, thankful for the opportunity that we have in this nation, the freedom that we have, that we can come together and worship you. And we pray, Father, that our worship will be pleasing and acceptable to you. Father, we come at this time with penitent hearts, asking you, Father, to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness that we might stand here in your sight. Father, we're thankful for the help that you've given to those that have been sick and had surgeries and various procedures. We're we're thankful for the progress that they have made. Pray, Father, that you'd continue to, to bless them, bless those that are in need. We especially pray, Father, for Brother Price Stewart, that he might continue to improve and regain his health. And also, Brother Kathy Metter, we pray that you would bless him and strengthen him in the, in the days and weeks to come. Father, we're also mindful of those that are bereaved, and we ask your blessings, Father, to, to be with them and bless them and comfort them as only you can. Father, we ask your blessings upon this congregation. We pray, Father, that you would help us, that we might grow in number, that we might grow in spirit, that we might grow in love one for another. We ask your blessings, Father, to help us to spread your word, whether it be local or whether it be in foreign lands. 
And we ask your blessings upon those that preach your word in foreign lands, Father, that you would watch over them and care for them and, and keep them safe, if it be your will. Father, we ask your blessings to be upon the leaders of our congregation. We pray that you would help them to make the decisions they need to make, that they might watch over the flock here in a way that would be pleasing to you. Father, we ask that you'd be with Brother Mitchell as he speaks to us this morning, that he might say the things that would be most needful, that we might be able to apply them to our lives and become stronger Christians and better examples for you. Father, we ask your blessings to people on the situation in the Ukraine. We pray, Father, that somehow that that would come to an end, that you would intervene in that and stop, stop that bloodshed. And we pray, Father, your blessings to be upon the leaders of the world and upon the leaders of our nation, Father. Father, I pray that they would look to you for strength and for guidance, that they might reign over their people that they might um, that they might help the people that they're responsible for, Father, to uh, to lead in a way that would be pleasing to you. Father, we're mindful of the things that are going on in our nation right now. There's many things, Father, that are that are evil. There are many things that are going on that, that go against your word. And we pray, Father, that some, somehow there would be a, a revival that, that our nation might repent of these things and, and turn to you, Father, if it be your will. Father, we ask that you would continue to watch over us and care for us. And thank you for ever blessing that you give us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. At the conclusion of Brother Lendl's remarks this morning, we're going to sing number 664, if you'd like to mark that. And before he brings this lesson, let's sing number 627. I'm in the way, the bright and shining way. I'm in the glory land way. Telling the world that Jesus says today. Yes, I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way.
Brother Bob did not exaggerate when he said if you go over to see Price, there'll be coffee on. If there isn't, it'll be on as soon as you come in the door. I don't know how many of you are coffee drinkers. I like robust coffee, but you drink some of Price's coffee and you may not sleep for a couple of days. Uh, but you'll have a good visit. Uh, they're sweet, sweet, kind people. I'm glad, so glad that he's uh, weathered this surgery uh, so well. We were concerned because of other medical problems. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 20, the text says, Now the man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Still is. Still is. Mothers are a treasure. In 1908, Miss Anna Jarvis of Philadelphia observed the first Mother's Day. She did that in memory of her own mom, and uh, she was convinced, and rightly so, as it proves out, that other people would share the sentiments that she felt, and so she began a campaign that grew to be a national campaign, that we have a designated Mother's Day. And little by little it grew, and eventually the U.S. Congress acted upon that with the encouragement of the president, uh, to the people, to participate, and indeed Mother's Day has now become virtually a worldwide observance. I found what I, I regard as an interesting tribute that was written in 1928 by a minister by the name of W.L. Caldwell. And you listen to what he says, and uh, we'll compare it to what we experience now. He says, Well, may we pause to pay honor to her who after Jesus Christ is God's gift to men, mother. If... Or it was she who shared her life with us when as yet our members were unformed. Into the valley of the shadow of death she walked that we might have life. In her arms was the garner of our food and the soft couch of our repose. There we nestled in the hour of pain and there was the playground of our infant glee. Those same arms later became our refuge and stronghold. It was she who taught our baby feet to go and lifted us up over the rough places. Her blessed hands plied the needle day and night to make our infant clothes. She put the book under our arm and started us off for school. But best of all, she taught our baby lips to list the name of Jesus and told us first the wondrous story of a Savior's love. The pride of America is its mother's. There are wicked mothers like Jezebel of old. There are unnatural mothers who sell their children into sin. There are sin-cursed, rum-soaked, and abandoned mothers to whom their motherhood is the exposure of their shame. But I'm glad to believe that there are comparatively few in this class. So said Mr. Caldwell in 1928. What about motherhood today in North America? Are mothers still the pride of America? In this self-centered age, sentiments expressed by Mr. Caldwell seem quaint, I would say, outside the church. We also know that the Supreme Court in 1973 handed down a ruling, and people have used that to practice abortion at virtually any place phase of gestation. 63 million innocent lives have been sacrificed. If what we read is true in the, from the statisticians, uh, over a million children are sexually assaulted every year in this country. At least 4 million are battered annually. And I fear for the general public what remains of Mother's Day is just commercialism. And that means mothers like you are all the more important, more vital, perhaps, than any other generation. And what my counsel would be is continue to model yourselves after the mothers in Scripture, the good mothers in Scripture. Strive for the humility of our Lord's mother, Mary. Luke 1, 
46, beginning, the angel had spoken to her of her favor to be entrusted with the Son of God. And Mary said, My soul exalts the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. For he has regard for the humble state of his bond slave. For behold, from this time on, all generations will count me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. She was a great, great person and a humble person. And I fear sometimes in the Lord's church to point out that she is not exalted to the place that she has in some religious circles, that we don't diminish her role. She was a great person. She's worthy of imitation. Seek to be prayerful like Hannah. You can find the prayer of Hannah or one of the prayers of Hannah in 1 Samuel 1. It's 28 verses. And in chapter 2, verse 11 verses. And she was a woman who was not blessed with children. And for her, this was just almost unbearable. And you read her earnest pleas for motherhood. And they were so genuine and so sincere, and God heard her call. And she'd made a vow to God, and she kept that vow. And she gave us one of the great, great men of human history, the last great judge of Israel. Pray like Hannah. Strive to be faithful like Sarah. After the initial shock came to her, Hebrews 11 and 11 says, By faith, even Sarah herself received the ability to conceive, even beyond the proper time of life, since she considered him faithful, who promised. She's worthy of imitation. Work to attain the kindness of Ruth in all your dealings, especially with your children. In uh, Ruth chapter 1, Verse 16, she's talking to her mother-in-law. Her mother-in-law has asked her to go back to her people because she's a destitute widow. And she can't really provide for Ruth. And she wants her to go back to her family where they would take care of her. But Ruth said, do not urge me to leave you or turn back from following you for where you go, I will go, and where you lodge, I will lodge. And your people shall be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and I will be buried. Thus may the Lord do to me, and worse, if anything but death parts you and me. And you know they went back to Israel, and you know the rest of the story. She becomes an ancestor. Be willing to sacrifice, as was Jochebed, and a woman of great, great courage. You think about her sacrifice in Exodus chapter 6, in verse 20, you see. Well, I'm going to read chapter 2 of Exodus, 1 through 3. It says, Now a man from the house of Levi went and married a daughter of Levi. The son conceived, or the woman rather, conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was beautiful, she hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she got him a wicker basket and covered it over with tar and pitch. And then she put the child in and set him among the reeds on the bank of the Nile. There was an edict from Pharaoh that male Hebrew children were to be destroyed at birth. Jacob had defied that. And had they caught her at that, she would have been immediately executed, probably her whole family. Extremely courageous person. Be willing to sacrifice. She put it on the line. In my mind, what a man Moses became. And he learned on his mother's lap while she was his nurse uh, who he was. And though raised as a crown prince in Egypt, the greatest empire in the world at the time. He knew he was a Hebrew. And what a man he became. What a mama he had. 
Strive for the courage of Rahab and of Esther. You remember when the spies came and she protected them, Rahab did, and asked that her family be spared, and Israel honored that. She's a courageous woman to have done that. And to remember Esther, the beautiful girl that became the queen of great empire. Very brave. Be as instructive as Eunice and Lois were with Timothy. In 2 Timothy 1 verse 5, Paul was able to write, I am mindful of the sincere faith within you, which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I'm sure that is in you as well. Paul didn't have to start over with Timothy. He already was acquainted with the words of God and had a reverence for God. And the text says specifically that his grandmother and his mother imparted that to him. It's happened a lot of times since. Seek the wisdom of Lemuel's mother in Proverbs 31 and be joyful like Elizabeth. Recall in Luke chapter 1 when she was visited by Mary, her son John in the womb, reacted, and so did she. Rise, ladies, to the challenge of being the kind of person that you want your children to imitate by you yourself imitating these righteous women. And I'll share with you some ways, some elements all of us would do well to follow, but particularly mothers among God's people. Obey the Lord yourself. It is pointless, virtually pointless, to try to persuade children to do what they do not see us do. If they do not see you obeying him day to day in life, then you're not going to have much success with them. There's much truth in the old axiom that says children become what they see. In Philippians 3 in verse 17, it says, Brethren, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern that you have in us. And then chapter 4 and verse 9, he said, The things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Again, we want to be that person that is worthy of imitation. And to be worthy of imitation, we have to obey the Lord. If you want your children to grow into faithful Christians, they need to see their mama following the Lord faithfully. We'll get dad on Father's Day, perhaps. But today we're concentrating on mothers. And because they're so vital. Children seem to me to be powerfully equipped with a hypocrisy detector. You know, and, and I tell people, you can fool anybody but little children and convicts, and I don't mean to equate them. But you, you will not be successful in pulling the wool over their eyes. And so you want to, to be genuine. They're not easily fooled by do as I say, not as I do lifestyle. Honor your own parents and your husband. My mother and father never had very much. They were working people. And they weren't demonstrative in front of us much. But I knew that those two people had a fierce love for each other. Never questioned it. Benefit from it. And I know that uh, my mother always was careful to honor her own parents. That lesson stuck with me. Your children need to see you properly honor your parents, whether they're living or dead, to, to honor them. And they need to see you honor their daddy. The principles found in Ephesians 6, 1 to 3, but it carries lifelong application where Paul writes, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. And so that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. If you want your children to become loving husbands or wives, depending on the gender, I have to say this nowadays, depending on the gender that God assigned them, 
If you want them to become that, then they need to observe that example in your marriage. Let them see the truth and the beauty of Ephesians chapter 5, beginning there at verse 22. I want to read that. Just let them see that lived out, this passage from Paul. Wives, be subject to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their own husbands and everything. Husbands, he very quickly says, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ also does the church because we are members of his body. For this reason, a man shall leave father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and they too shall become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife, even as himself, and the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. So he lays the foundation for a, a just and fully operative, optimally operative society. Teach your children God's word, Mom. Dad has responsibility, Ephesians 6, 4. Your fathers, bring your children up in the admonition of the Lord. Don't provoke them. But Mama does too. I remember as a little boy being read to by my mother. And when I got older, Bible class was done with my dad. So I got both. But Moses wisely instructed the Israelites in Deuteronomy 6, verses 6 and 7. I want to cite it from the King James Bible just because I like the poetic sound of it. And these words I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thy house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. The world in which we live, the media environment where we find ourselves has a lot of positives, but it also has a lot of tools, some of them very addictive tools, to capture your children. you got to get there first. And what you do from zero to three will never be undone by anybody. you got to get there first. Note the word diligently in the passage from Moses. This means more often than now and then when there's not a game on or, you know, whatever. It means more than that. Encourage your children often. Children are like tender plants, and they require nurture. You want to make sure that your children hear you say that you love and value them. I treasure the fact that the last words I said to my grandson were, I love you. They need to hear that. And they need to hear that with regularity lest the world should take them from you. Let them hear those affirmations often. You're not going to spoil them by telling them that you love them, that they've done good, praise their good efforts, and help them learn from their mistakes. Help them learn to accept mistakes. You know, I've dealt with one or two that were harder on themselves than I ever was. Because I always knew that if you do your best, that's acceptable to God, and it better be acceptable to me. But children need to, to hear 
when they've done well. And they need to hear these affirmations. And they, they need help when they stumble and when they make a mistake and when they're disappointed by that. Show them that you regard them as a heritage from the Lord. Um, you know, it's a, it's a great thing when someone is blessed with a child. In Psalm 127, beginning at verse 3, Behold, children are a gift of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are children of one's youth. How blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be ashamed when they speak with their enemies in the gate. This is not what the psalmist is talking about, but I remember one time one of my good friends' dad bought a truck and he had all kind of trouble with it. And he finally went down to the dealership and two big boys standing at the office of the manager. And he said, now you can write me a check for that truck or you can whoop me in these boys. I don't recommend that that approach. Uh, but they were they were close to one another, and children need that. Children need to know that they're not a burden, that they're not too much trouble, and all of that. And I know one of the things, one of the most beautiful things that you will ever see, is in a nursery when. Those nurses will give that baby to the mother and, and preferably skin-to-skin -skin contact. And the bond that takes place in the utter, absolute love that is apparent. Um, you'll, you'll never get to witness anything. That would, that would cause a stone to shed tears. And your children need to know that they're a blessing to your life. Are they exasperating? Sometimes. But mostly... Uh, they're just a great joy. Rebuke your children when it's necessary. Do not be afraid to admonish your children when they do something that's wrong. And do not make excuses for that. I'm going to read the, the translation of Proverbs uh, a little differently because Solomon uses the word rod. We think about a club. And I'm going to use the word switch in its place because that's more what he's getting at. Proverbs 13, 24, He who withholds his switch hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him diligently. Proverbs 22, verse 15, Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child and the rod of discipline will remove it, or the switch of discipline will remove it far from him. So over and over, uh, Proverbs 23, 13, do not hold back discipline from the child. Although you strike him with a switch, he will not die. You, will, you shall strike him with a switch and rescue his soul from Sheol. I don't know how you were, but I know from personal experience that I could uh, on occasion be stubborn. And I was blessed to have a mother and a daddy that could rectify that problem. And I just was not going to be allowed to be an outlaw. Not going to be allowed to disrespect others, teachers and what have you. And I wasn't, uh, had no reason to be afraid of the police, but I had a great love and a fear of mama and daddy. I've probably told you before, one time as a little boy, I'd push my mother past her limit. She's a very tolerant woman. I heard her hit that back screen door, and I knew where she was going. And so I appealed to my dad, and my dad just laughed. He said, don't get me involved in this boy. You, got, you made that redhead woman mad. And she came in with a switch, sure enough. But changed that dynamic that was going on rather abruptly. Sometimes, not often, not often, but when it becomes necessary, do not be afraid to administer admonishment, not cruelty, but admonishment. Understand, mothers, that your estate, your position is a divine position, it is appointed by God. God 
entrusted his own son, we've already seen, to a mother in Israel, a young virgin girl. And the result of her good work is seen in Luke 2, 52. And I know Joseph, no doubt, in his shop talked to him. And when he got old enough, he went to the synagogue. But the first stories he heard was from Mary. And by the time he's 12 years old, and Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men, she was entrusted with the task of imparting wisdom and vocabulary and mathematical skills and, and the operation of house, household items. You learn that from your mama. A child learns from his mother how the world works. Stature. She sees to the child's feeding, to his care. Verse Samuel 2 and verse 19 says, And his mother would make him a little robe and bring it to him year after year when he would come, or she would come up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. That's Hannah coming to see about her boy Samuel. Favor with God. Mother sees to that child's spiritual needs. But she's got them first. Before Jesus ever went to the synagogue, he learned of God from his mother. Before he became self-aware, he'd learned from her. And thus in Luke chapter 2, verses 46 and 47, you know the story. They'd gone to worship. They'd, the family had left. No Jesus. Where's Jesus? They looked among all the kinfolks and all their acquaintances. No Jesus. Finally go tearing back to Jerusalem. Look for three days. Finally go into the temple, and there he sits. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. Well, he was the son of God, you say. Yes, he was, and he was Mary's boy too. Favor with man, kindness, gentleness, truthful, courageous, law-abiding, follows the customs of the law, observes rules of etiquette. Where do you get that from your mother? Just I hear mine, tuck your shirt tail in, comb your hair, tie your shoes. You don't see your daddy acting like that, do you? Slopping around. You learn those things from mama. In the most formative years, her influence is powerfully felt in that child's socialization. And if they are mannerly and respectful, it's generally due in significant measure to their mother. So profound are the earliest lessons that when we think of the paths our lives have taken, you cannot ignore the lessons you got from her. Her value is immeasurable. God designed and created the position, and her husband named it. Genesis 3, verse 20 again says, Now the man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all the living. Without mothers, humanity dies. She alone is the bearer of life. Mothers are among our greatest examples of devotion and self-sacrifice. John chapter 19, verse 25 says, Therefore the soldiers did these things, but watch, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. And when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, referring to John, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son, referring to John. And then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own household. Dying on the cross, he took care of his mama. Mother is our example. She's our guide. She's our most trusted friend. Her reward? Few will ever have the money to pay their mother for the time and the attention that she has invested. You often hear people say something like, well, I, you couldn't pay me to do that. But if it's a needful thing, mama will do it for free. She doesn't require a payment. And who can pay for the sleepless nights? 
Who can pay for the moments of terror when a child is injured or the drudgery of one more load of clothes? How do you compensate for that? Well, her reward comes from seeing sons and daughters become men and women of God. That's the reward. Useful, kind, diligent, decent people. Proverbs 22, beginning at verse 22, Solomon writes, Listen to your father who begot you and do not despise your mother when she is old. Buy the truth and do not sell it. Get wisdom and instruction and understanding. The father of the righteous will greatly rejoice and he who sires a wise son will be glad in him. Let your father and your mother be glad. Let her rejoice who gave birth to you. Really sad scene I've seen more than once out here at the prison unit is to see an older mother who is obviously not part of the criminal element having to visit a wayward sign, but she's there. Mother's reward comes in moments of appreciation from her children and from her husband. In Proverbs 31, beginning at verse 28, he writes, her children rise up and bless her, her husband also, and he praises her, saying, Many daughters have done nobly, but you excel them all. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord shall be praised. Give her the product of her hands and let her works praise her in the gates. Her reward comes when Yahweh says, Well done, my daughter. As Christians, we have so much to be thankful for. And especially, we should be thankful for our mothers. Thankful to God for providing for us. Thankful to Christ for saving us. And thankful to our mothers for living for us. And let the Lord hear your prayers of thanksgiving. And let your mama hear tender praise. We praise the maker of mothers because he makes them kind, he makes them compassionate, and he makes them caring. If you are a Christian who has fallen away today, God is kind and compassionate and caring towards you. And he stands ready like the father of the prodigal son to show mercy this very day. And you can repent of whatever it is that now separates between you and your Lord and come back into his loving fellowship. And I'd urge you to do it. And if you are not a Christian this morning, God's mercy and compassion is available to you too. He has provided a path to reconciliation with him. And I plead with you to heed his directives this day. Hear his words. I know you've been sitting here for 33 minutes, but I have no idea how much you've heard the word. And so I would urge you, hear his word. Jesus often said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And he meant really hear. Believe with all of your heart. Hebrews 11 and verse 6 tells us, Without faith it is impossible to please him. He who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Repent of your sins. If you've not done that, repent and turn away from it. The times of ignorance God winked at, but now commands all men everywhere to repent because he's a provider today in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he has ordained. Confess Jesus as the Son of God. Remember when Peter was asked, who do you say that I am? He said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then come and submit to baptism for the remission of sins. Sin cannot come into the presence of the Lord, and you can't have the forgiveness of sins unless you get where Jesus put it. And that's in the water or grave of baptism. If we can help you, render obedience to his majesty the King. Let us do that. Right now, as together we stand and sing. Drifting 
friend. Some on their fame or their treasure or their land. Mine's on the rock that forever shall stand. Jesus, a rock of ages. That rock's a cross, its arms outspread. Celestial glory bases its head to its firm base, my all I bring, and to the cross of ages clean. Some build their homes on the ever drifting sand, some on the fame. the rock of ages, that rocks a tower whose lofty height illumined heaven's unclouded light, old swatted gates beneath the dome, where saints find rest with Christ and some build their homes on the ever drifting sand. Some on their fame or their treasure or their land. Mine's on the rock that forever shall stand. Jesus, the rock of ages. Be seated, please. One of my fondest memories from childhood is my mom rocking my baby sisters and singing, Be not dismayed, whatever be tied, God will take care of you. And I don't know how she expected us to understand <laughs> dismayed or be tied, but we did. And uh, that uh, that's touched us all, all our lives. We've come to a part in our worship where we remember what that baby of Mary's did for us. And as we prepare to partake of the Lord's Supper, let's sing number 859. He paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. And now I sing a brand new song, amazing grace. Christ Jesus paid the debt that I could never pay. He paid that debt at Calvary. He cleansed my soul and set me free. I'm glad that Jesus did all my sins erase. I now can sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace. Christ Jesus paid the debt that I could never One day he's coming back for me to live with him eternally. Won't it be glory to see him on that day? I then will sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace. Christ Jesus paid the debt that I could never pay. As we're gathered here today on this first day of the week, one of the primary things that we do each Lord's Day is to remember Christ's death on the cross for our sins. 
this memorial, Jesus says, as, as long as we do this, we proclaim his death until he comes. He tells us to do this in remembrance of him, in remembrance of the, the perfect life that he lived. In remembrance, as Lyndall talked in our Bible class this morning, of the sham of a trial that he stood before Pilate, stood before Herod, before he was crucified, the, the tremendous torture that he went through was scourging before he was crucified and then being hung on the cross with nails in his hands and his feet, having the crown of thorns on his head as he willingly gave himself for us. We're told to examine ourselves that we partake in a way pleasing in his sight. As we partake of the, these emblems this morning, let us think of all these things. And would you pray with me now, please? Our Father, we thank you so much for your love, for Jesus' love, that he was willing to give himself on the cross for us, Father, that he paid the debt that we could not pay. Father, as we examine ourselves, help us to partake of this bread that represents Christ's body that hung on that cross. Father, that we may do it in a way well-pleasing in thy sight. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Would you pray with me again? Father, again, we approach your throne as we are about to partake of this fruit of the vine, which represents Jesus' blood that he shed for our sins on the cross. Father, may we do this in a way well-pleasing in your sight. It's in his name we pray. Amen. That concludes the Lord's Supper. At this time, we will have a, a prayer for our, our offering. As most of you know, there's a box in the back as you exit the foyer that you can place your contribution. Would you pray with me, please? Father, we thank you again for this beautiful Lord's Day that we can come together to worship you, to sing songs, to offer prayers, to hear a message from your word to remember your son's death on the cross, Father, and now to give back of our means. Father, as we give back, we pray that we will do so as we purposed in our heart and that we will give, give cheerfully, Father. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you for being here today. If your mother lives, make every effort to tell her how much you love her. If she's passed on, think about the great sacrifice that she made and what enrichment she's brought to your life, and thank God for that. I hope that you'll come back tonight at 6 o'clock. I want us to talk about a, that place to which we go in the upper and better kingdom uh, where the problems and the trials and the difficulties and the things that frighten us are all banished from that place. And I hope that you'll come back and hear that and share that with us. Let's be standing as we're dismissed, please. If you would, please bow. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you have blessed us with and this time that we had to gather together on this first day of the week and to worship you and to study another portion of your word. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for all the many ways in which you have blessed us. We are especially mindful today of the blessing that we have of our mothers. And dear Heavenly Father, we are 
mindful of the sacrifice that Jesus made so that we can have a hope of an eternity with you. And dear Heavenly Father, we, as we look towards that day, we hope that we live lives that will be pleasing in your sight. We continue to strive to do that so that someday we can have a reunion with those who've gone before us and that we can have an eternity with you. We pray that you please be with us as we depart from here. Keep us safe. May we live lives that find up we will be found pleasing in your sight. And dear Heavenly Father, if time stands, it's our prayer that we will be back at the next appointed hour. And it's in your son's name that we do pray. Amen.